You're listening to Cloud9, where Bahaiteachings.org interviews artists from around the globe to learn about what inspires, uplifts, and motivates them to make a positive contribution to the world. My name is Shadi Talui Wallace. Mary Darling is the co-owner, CEO, director, writer, and executive producer of the media production company, Westwind Pictures. And she is on a mission to reinvent the entertainment industry, one Westwind show at a time. She's been telling stories through film and media for over 30 years, with a mission to produce scripted narratives that can change the world. Westwind Pictures is responsible for many Canadian TV productions, such as Designer Guys and What on Earth?, but is most known for producing the world's first Muslim family comedy called Little Mosque on the Prairie, which aired for six seasons in over 120 countries. Mary has devoted her life to exploring how her identity as a woman, mother, and Baha'i can be infused into the media that she creates. Last year, Mary was asked to attend a forum at the United Nations that was following the discourse on the status of women and media. Furthermore, she was also asked to speak on a panel that explored the role of media in advancing gender equality and freedom of religion. In this interview with Cloud9, Mary shares more about her experience at the UN, her goals in creating media that promotes empathy, compassion, and integration, and how she is reshaping the media industry by utilizing the Baha'i approach to consultation. We also learn more about an exciting upcoming project that she's working on, which explores the theme of justice with human rights lawyer Payam Akavan. I had the opportunity to visit Mary Darling in her studio, located just outside of Hamilton, Ontario, where she graciously accepted an interview with Cloud9. Mary, thank you so much for joining us on Cloud9. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Could we start by maybe how you first heard about the Baha'i Faith and how you came into Mm. the Baha'i Faith? So I heard about the Baha'i Faith um, about 30 years ago um, when a man that I was interested in uh, said, I'm a Baha'i and that means I believe in Baha'u'llah. And something in me moved. And that came, I guess, following a real search, a spiritual search um, around, I guess, why there wasn't more inclusivity in religion, how there could be so many Hindus and so many Buddhists and so many Muslims and not have sort of overlap in that world. Um, And so my search uh, sort of ended with me understanding, I felt like the social teachings in each religion had its time and place and the spiritual teachings seemed eternal. And so when I began to investigate the faith some years after that, I learned that Baha'u'llah, the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith, really, really made that very clear that there's one religion and that they're progressive in nature. And um, and so that resonated very deeply with me at the time. And where were you living at that time? At that time, I was in Minnesota. Okay. I was a kid in Minnesota. Kid. Yeah. How old were you? I was 18 when I first heard about the faith. Oh. From Minnesota, I ended up in Philadelphia for a while. Uh, my husband at the time went to Temple University and did his Master of Fine Arts in Radio TV Film. Um, and so I was working um, in advertising during that time. And a man named Brian Tierney took me very much under his wing. I was a kid. I mean, I was 22 years old or something at that point and really trained me in um, event production, like large event production and public relations and advertising. So I was working on with clients like Campbell's Soup and McDonald's and I got to drive the Oscar Mayer Wienermobile, which was a pretty big deal. Um, it was fun. Um, and I really fell in love with storytelling during that time. Um, when Dan finished his MFI, we moved back to Minnesota and continued to raise a family. And I began doing some artist management at that time um, and just freelancing. And um, anyway, did a variety of things that always kind of kept me connected to storytelling and narrative storytelling um, while raising my kids. So, um yeah, so we ended up serving at Lou Helen Baha'i School for a little bit, and then I moved to Canada sometime after that. And I know that, I mean, you had four children at the time, mm-hmm. and you were working. How? Yeah. What does that balance look like for a young mom? Wow, everybody asks me what the balance looks like for a young mom. There is no balance, really, for a young mom. I think that um, being Baha'i 
kept me very grounded. I understood that my job um, in relationship to my family was that they came first, um, that I was the first educator of my children and that I really had to make sure that they were receiving what they what they needed. Um, one of my most powerful moments was when my, because um, I really did all my work, I guess, uh, whether it was creating or organizing or doing, I did some graphic design and stuff too. Um, but I did it all at night after the kids went to bed. I also did laundry at like two o'clock in the morning. I, I was moms just, have learned how to utilize that evening. Yeah, <laughs> well, like to the extreme, yeah, but... Yeah. Um, laundry at 2 a.m. Laundry at 2 a.m. while I was writing. And um, my one of my favorite parenting moments was going to my daughter Jale's Mother's Day celebration one year when she was in first or second grade. And everybody was, you know, bragging about what their moms did. And Jale got up and she looked at me sitting back in the back of the of the class and she said, my mom, she doesn't really do anything. She's just with us all the time. And I was like, score, that's it, you know, because I really, so there's not really, you just make the sacrifice on the other end. Mm -hmm. So I, I was determined to just be present with my kids and and take care of what I had to do in, in the in-between time, you know. So tell me about Westwind. Yeah, so um, Westwind Pictures was founded actually by my husband in 1989 in Regina, Saskatchewan, um, a place where you wouldn't think there were a lot. There was a lot of production, but there was a lot of production back yeah, in I know those that, days. Yeah, Saskatchewan had a huge film industry. There's a lot of and music industry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, and a lot of that had to do with American productions shooting in Saskatchewan. It also had to do with. Um, just a great artistic community. I mean, when you fly into Regina, Saskatchewan, you it's like you're arriving in an island. You're the wheat field is the ocean, and suddenly you're on this in this city. Um, and I think what the production community had there was just such unity and such cooperation uh, because you're you have to cooperate to make it work. So it was a nice environment. Um, so Westwind grew out of that, and Clark decided to open up a Toronto office some time later. Um, and that's when I joined the company. Was in uh, was in Toronto, um, and Westwind. I, I would say from the time I joined, at least, we were really focused on trying to um, balance who we are as Baha'is with the kind of content that we were interested in making. So even uh, even with some of the design programs that we did, which are really fun and funny, you might be able to find them on YouTube. Um, uh, a show like Designer Guys was really one of the first shows that had designers conflicting, but in a very positive way. What does um, that look like? What it looks like is there's a wonderful quote um, in the Baha'i writings that talk about consultation and that through the clash of differing opinions, a spark of truth can come forth. And so uh, we had done a lot of interior design program. I was so bored of it. I could barely stand it. And um, and yet they were good shows and they rated well on HGTV and different channels like that. But it was always people, um, you know, complimenting each other sort of in an, on an inauthentic way. Mm -hmm. um, and I was really interested in what it would be like to have two people really explore design more deeply. So it seems like such a superficial thing, but of course, Baha'u'llah talks a lot about the importance of beauty and um, and that uh, beauty and cleanliness is conducive to spirituality. And so I sort of said, okay, if I'm going to have to do design programming, I'm going to do it with as much spiritual infusion as possible. The journey of Westwind really does, I think, in a way, come down to that, um, that kind of minute of deciding to be very intentional about um, infusing your work with spiritual principles and ideas. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, Clark had done a lot of programming before I joined the company that was really noteworthy. Um, he did a daily show on um, CBC called What on Earth? And that show was really exploring on um, sort of how the world works and who are the contributors, um, who are the change makers sort of in the world. And it was a daily morning show on CBC. So I think the company's always been particularly interested in um, sort of where the principles of the Baha'i faith around unity and diversity and those kinds of things come into programming for mm -hmm. um, uh, an audience. Um, so when you were speaking about these opposing <clears throat> views, I thought you were kind of going to go into Little Mosque on the Prairie. Right. Well, that's what it grew out of. So <laughs> what's funny is through Designer Guys, um, 
that show, for a variety of reasons, ended prematurely. We ended up letting it go because of unity issues. Um, and I won't get into the details of that, okay. but after three seasons, Clark and I said a number of prayers and met with our partners and said, let's not do this anymore. Um, and went back to our empty office of about six or 7,000 square feet at the time with our son, John, who was um, our receptionist at the time, essentially sleeping at the front desk. <laughs> <laughs> and the two of us in this cavernous space wondering what was next. Um, and worried, you know, we had made a very, um, you know, thoughtful and spiritual decision to step away from uh, something that had become really infused with disunity and and then just prayed about what we should do next. And uh, there was a man across the road from us who had done a lot of scripted television. Mm -hmm. And we thought we should do something now in the scripted space, but we'd never really done that before. So we went and met with our friend, Peter, We'd done a lot of television in Canada, and we said, what do we do to move our company into that? Because we'd become very known. We'd done hundreds of this, just, you know, hundreds of hours of this design television, and we'd be really become known as sort of the go-to design people, which is not our first interest. Um, what would you say your first interest is? Scripted narrative that can change the world okay. is our first interest. Uh, it's a good mission. Yeah, scripted narrative that can make people just think different or introduce people to different audiences yeah. or build empathy and compassion, or at least allow people to stand in each other's shoes. That really the best use of media is that. Mm -hmm. um, and so Peter said, you should just find find a project that you really love that you could spend five years with and, and pursue it and make sure it's a project you love because you're going to be bored out of your head by the end of it. Right. Um, and so it wasn't that much longer later that we met um, Zarka Nawaz at the Banff Television Festival and... Uh, and she really wanted to do something funny about her community. Um, and she's a Muslim woman, young Muslim woman, feminist. Um, and we said, let's do that. So we um, embarked together on this journey. Two weeks later, we had a sort of a first draft of a really a co-created piece, I would say. Zarka was very, very interested in exploring what it would be like to have um, a Canadian-born imam. Because at that time, most imams in Canada and in the U.S. were imported. Mm -hmm. Um, and so you have people coming in and leading congregations who don't really understand the culture yet. Um, and we were really interested in what would it be like to bring two communities into a very tight, very tight proximity. Um, and so that's where that character Amar came from, was Zarka's idea um, of, of having a Canadian-born, educated imam. He was a lawyer-turned-imam. Um, who the only place he could find a job was out in the middle of the Canadian prairies. And so you have this brown guy now arriving in the middle of nowhere. We actually shot it out in Indian Head, Saskatchewan, but fictionally named the town Mercy. Um, and so this it's sort of a fish out of water story with a guy from Toronto going to a small town, but also a Muslim going into a very Christian place. Um, and then the only place that will rent to the mosque is a church. And so the mosque sets up in a church. And so you have all of the wonderful um, story and comedy that Dynamic. can be generated by two communities kind of crammed into the same space. Um, so that's really where that show got its start. And then we did six seasons on CBC here in Canada. Um, and we sold the show to over 120 countries around wow. the world, which has been interesting. Um, I think maybe it's it sounds like a very relatable story. Maybe not the imam I mean, there's plenty of Muslims that are raised in the, in the West, but mm -hmm. maybe not like something that would be featured on on national television. Yeah, I think nobody it's expected really nobody expected to see a comedy either about Muslims. It is the world's first Muslim comedy. Yeah. Um, but even that, I wouldn't even necessarily call it a Muslim comedy. I would mm -hmm. call it a a family comedy, which happens to have Muslims and Christians in it. Um, and so. I think uh, that's really what excites us at West Wind is projects which are exploring um, how we're more alike than we're different, really exploring the oneness of the world of humanity through a narrative script. And so we have a number of projects that we're pitching right now that have that at, at its core, which may or may not get made depending on, you know, you're always pitching to the gatekeepers and you just hope that hope beyond hope that they're going to, you know, understand what it is and why you're trying to do it. Yeah, what goes through your mind when you, you I mean, you have to have such a spirit of detachment as we mentioned earlier. So what goes through your mind, you're investing all your heart and mm. soul and energy into these projects and you're pitching them and then 
what ha- what does that look like? Yeah, it's really hard. I mean, <laughs> just surrendering yourself. You just to the surrender film yourself. Gods. <laughs> well, you know, we often say because we we really believe in the power of prayer, and also, you know, you saw that I I started. I've got a little um, uh, a little piece of art in my in my headquarters, my shed in the backyard here in Ancaster. Which, whenever I come out here, I start it going and. Um, because my dad passed away about 13 years ago, I always think that's, you know, that's my reminder that my dad is always with me. And it's so a little, it's a little clock kind of, what do you call it? It's like a little, a Not little a ship, um, a Panama ship. <laughs> yeah. It's a little Panama ship that when you, when you touch it, it just rocks back and forth like a ship on the sea. Quite relaxing. Yeah. It's actually really nice. And, uh, anybody who's in this shed with me knows that that's, that I'll get up to go and make that move again the whole time I'm, I'm, it's I'm out here. Down, actually. Really? Yeah. Oh, oh, <laughs> we'll just keep going. Um, but it's a reminder of, you know, the very thin veil between this world and the next, and that I can call on those souls in the next world, um, for assistance. And so, the way Clark and I work, I would say, is to try to create prayerfully what we think might help move discourse along in the world. Um, and then we really pray to those souls in the next world to assist us, right, to help influence the arts in this world. And then we just knock on the doors. And, and you know, if, if uh, as we pray, we sort of think that confirmation is the door that opens. And so we create and create and create and create, and then we go and push on all the doors to see if there's anybody interested in what we're creating. Um, so Clark has said before, as we've been going up to a pitch meeting, you know, we'll get on an elevator and he'll say, this elevator is very crowded <laughs> when it's really just the two of us in it. And we know that we're, we're in a way, we're just trying to push those doors open or, or at least see if they come open easily. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's funny when you pitch something and it's the right time and the right person, it just starts to get its own traction and, and its own momentum. Um, and that we take as confirmation. Is there like a feeling that you look for inside of you when you walk into a space? We just try to be as you said, detached, mm-hmm. but you know, we're not there to try to sell something. We're there to s- sort of float and see it's if the right it's the thing. right thing. Yeah. Um, and it's, and it's interesting. The feeling is, um, you know, we had a, we had a pitch to the document documentary unit at CBC, um, a couple of days ago. We're working right now on a large scale doc with Payam Akhavan, human rights lawyer, where we're really exploring a justice. And so that we're doing with CBC and, and also on the French side with CBC, uh, English speaking Montreal and things like this. And that project really, um, from the time we decided to pursue it, um, not that it's not, it wasn't hard to get all the partners on because you have to have perseverance and be long suffering and, you know, build relationships and, uh, and be able to, you know, tell the story. But that one really felt like, okay, this is one that's supposed to get made. Right. Mm-hmm. And I think, yeah. I think of um, Mona, who was a young woman just about the time I was becoming a Baha'i, um, she was executed in Iran for belief in her faith. And she was a um, a friend of Payam Akhavan's. And that was the thing that sort of set him, her execution was the thing that set him on his path. And in a way, with that particular piece, when I think about the relationship between this world and the next, and especially as it relates to artistic endeavor in this world, I really feel like Mona has been guiding that project. Mm. Um, So much so that when we were in talking with CBC last week and we started talking about Mona, she said, I want her woven into this story um, in a more profound way. Like it really, her story really is a story of incredible perseverance and sacrifice um, and beautiful sacrifice. And so there's that. But when you're when you're pitching these other things. um, You know, we're pitching a, a documentary right now about youth rising, you know, that. Finally, it seems like in the world, um, in the in the world at large, people are starting to think again about the voice of youth with these school shootings and things like that. And so we're developing a project about youth finding their voice in the arts and how that relates to giving them a voice in other spheres as well. Um, and how they're using uh, this new, very fearful item of technology called social media. Exactly. That, yeah, it's actually quite, it's, it has a very empowering uh, 
ability as well for you. Yeah, it's really revolutionary. Yeah. It gives it gives kids a voice who otherwise wouldn't have it. And and so I relate that to what Westwind is up to because um, because of the diversity of the projects that we have going often are just because we become inspired by something mm. um, and we decide to pursue it. It feels like it's been gifted to us. So we have to honor honor it and and try to pitch it and find a home for it. Um, that doesn't mean that it always happens. It doesn't mean that we have God on our side or something and therefore everything we pitch um, is going to go, although that would be really great. <laughs> it doesn't seem, it doesn't Just seem, one idea. Oh, it doesn't seem to be the way it works. Um, what about, uh, you mentioned a few uh, like different areas of discourse that you're exploring, uh, as a production company, mm -hmm. but as an individual, I know that you just visited the United Nations in New York yeah. and, um, you're speaking on a, on a, pa a panel Couple panels, yeah. uh, for women and media. Could you share a bit about yeah. what, what that experience yeah. was like? Had you been to the UN before? Uh, I was at the UN as a kid. So it was very interesting to go back through that building and, you know, see some of the murals that I had seen and realize how much I had changed. Um, that I remembered, um, I remembered standing in certain places, but feeling very different. Um, yeah, but I was invited to the UN really to try to follow the um, discourse at the Commission on the Status of Women that just happened recently, um, to try to follow the discourse around um, something that's very near and dear to my heart, which is the discourse around media in the world and the importance of media and honest media and trustworthy media, something that the world is really struggling with right now. And um, so this particular commission was called, um, which is an annual commission at the UN, and it was around the status of women, particularly as it relates to rural women and girls. And, uh, you know, and I think I'm a fairly well-read or interested woman um, in what's going on with women and girls in the world, but I really wasn't prepared for the stories that I heard um, at the UN when, when Clark met me a week later and I kept trying to tell him about what the commission was all about, I would start to cry every time. Um, so hopefully we won't. We can cry. No, we're gonna, I'm going to try not to cry. I'm cry. feeling it right now, but I'm going to... It's gonna, a safe space. Woo, okay. Anyway, yeah, it's my shed. It's a safe place. Um, but uh, what's interesting around um, this discourse that I was following particularly, which is media, and then as it relates to women and girls, is that, you know, we really don't know what's going on in the world in reality, especially here in the U.S. or Canada, um, you know, we are hearing very curated stories. Kind of shielded or protected. Very shielded or protected. And the rest of the world is is going through what the rest of the world is, but we need to become urgently concerned with what those things are. And media, I think, has a particular role. So one of the things that I was speaking about at the UN was um, the, the role of media in advancing gender equality and also the role of media as it relates to um, the advancement of freedom of religion, especially for women. Um, both really interesting discourses to follow. Um, but, you know, I don't think, I don't think we're thinking enough these days about really what is media um, and, and how do we in the media need to be, how do we need to purify ourselves to be actual instruments of the change we want to see in the world. What did they define as as media? Like, how did you all from like these vast countries and, mm -hmm. and cultures, how did you find a, a common framework to build upon? Yeah, I can't say that we did okay. actually, yeah. Um, I think that people, there were journalists there following some of the media streams. There were, um, you know, like newspaper journalists, there were television journalists, there were, um, people like me that do more narrative or factual content. Um, so I think the idea of media was really the reflection back at society of where we think we are. Mm -hmm. And from a Baha'i standpoint, I'm really interested in reflecting back to society something slightly better than what we have, right? That um, sort of it's easy to engage in the, the, the narrative uh, and if you watch television, you'll see it, the narrative around um, sort of dismay and disempowerment and, um, you know, like the despair, you know, it's easy to use media to sell despair. When I think about the number of 
shows we could have made and shows that we had been pitched or asked to option that are, you know, some of them have been made. Um, and they're really depressing and they're not, they don't give a viewer anywhere to aspire to. Mm. Um, I think that that's tricky in our business, that we know we could easily sell some of these other things, which um, which just aren't good for us in a way. Um, but the media we were interested in exploring for for myself as I was following the discourse at the UN was what does it mean to try to make um, a media contribution which can actually inspire and inform. In other words, um, showing something slightly better than where we are so that um, we're thinking about, you know, whose face are we putting the microphone in front of? Is it the loudest um, or is it the most powerful? Is it the one that's contributing to disintegration or the one that's contributing towards integration or positive activities. And too often, because the media right now is fixated on ratings and uh, popularity contest and getting first to the story, um, I find that as a culture in media, we're putting the microphone in front of mouths that don't necessarily need to be amplified. Instead, if we put, if we chose to put that microphone in front of um, mouths which were working towards something together, it'd be interesting. And I know, for example, the um, the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of the United States, their media department just recently, and the National Spiritual Assembly is the governing body, which would be um, for that particular con um, country in the U.S. Um, they just did um, a short documentary on race amity, which aired on WGBH in Boston. And that documentary was interesting because it followed the race discourse uh, during the same, you know, the same time through slavery and through um, um, racism and through everything else that you hear about in the U.S. Uh, it instead chose to follow that trajectory through race amity. And so they looked at the other history and they said, all the, the time that people, yeah, and, all the time people were fighting, there were also groups coming together. Right. All the time there were groups trying to change the world. There were groups quietly meeting to change the world. Um, but we tend to, again, going back to media discourse, we tend to amplify what has action attached to it and and define action often as conflict. Mm -hmm. That um, produces like a feeling of anger and, and frustration. And right. Angst. Yeah. As compared to following the narrative, which actually has it's like the leaven in the bread you know it only takes a little bit to make the whole loaf rise and there's always people when you hear all the noise through media mm -hmm. there's always that other side that if you can find it and contribute toward it and let people know that it exists positive positive change can happen um so that's where we're really interested in um contributing in that sort of stream so I came away feeling hopeful, mm. but still like it's a huge machine and how does communication actually happen and where can the where can a change of heart actually take place and um and when do people stop thinking about their own self interests and start thinking about global interests and as we're producing in general is how do we reflect back as I was saying something better than what the world ar already has how do we show um different models of decision-making and things like that, which doesn't necessarily happen in the narrative part of our programs, but really are what we, is how, it's how we try to run our business and run our productions is to um, constantly experiment with the broken models that exist in our industry itself, um, which are very hierarchical. You know, the director is always God. Um, there's very specific things that you do on set, that, things that you don't do on set. Um, the way decisions are made and you're told what to do and things like that. We're very interested in the productions that we do. And Little Mosque was our best chance to experiment with that um, in how we how we just make our contribution towards reinventing the entire entertainment. <laughs> we always say we're going to re reinvent the entertainment industry one, one West Wind show at a time, but <laughs> that's like going a little too far. Um, but really, we're trying to constantly say, you know, how do we... Um, infuse a spirit of consultation into our company. You know, consultation is very important um, from a Baha'i point of view because uh, going back to what I was saying about the designer guys um, and thinking that that spark of conflict can bring about a better decision, 
consultation is a very important tool that's little known about and little used yet. I think we're still really learning how to use it, where you try to create an environment where people can contribute while detaching to their own ideas yeah. and really make an offering, which then can be built on and built on and built on by others in the room. And so you might have the very best idea come from somebody who shouldn't even be in that room. If you were living by the old hierarchical entertainment rules, Yeah, there would be very specific people in a writing room or very specific people um, in that a director tone. Like it's very, yeah. yeah. And so you don't get to benefit from the person that says, well, I don't really know anything about this, but what if, you know? And so often it's, those are the ideas. Um, so making, creating a space for that kind of dialogue. Yeah. Darker. So, Coming to a close, what what would you recommend to a young budding filmmaker, or producer, mm. especially a young woman who's also recognizing the need for this kind of discourse to be infused into into media? What would you recommend to her? Maybe mm. maybe to me. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> to someone like me. So um, I recommend um, adopting a learning mode, moving into a learning mode, and really adopting a prayerful attitude and trusting your intuition. Um, I find in our business, and I think in much of the art world, um, when you meet women, and especially women in power, uh, so many are women who have adopted ways of being kind of a, a guy. Yeah. But finding out those, find, discovering those ways to bring really who you are to the banquet table or yeah. to the, into, into your world, your artistic sphere, I think is very, very important. And then not losing hope so that, because um, the sooner I think the world can benefit from women contributing as women and women not contributing in some role where they think they have to be a certain way, but really bringing authenticity to the table, I think things will pick up steam very, very quick. Um, for me, I, I say prayers with Clark every morning and every night. Um, and we really th try to think prayerfully around um, the projects that we're choosing to pursue and the ones that we're, you know, finally letting go that, you know, we just love and we think they should be made, but they're never going to be made or they're not going to be made now and sort of practicing a spiritual rhythm. I yeah. think that... And remaining aware of those those confirmations, as you mentioned. Exactly. Earlier, yeah. And I think expecting confirmation. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, after I say prayers, I, I always get up and I think, so where is it? Mm -hmm. Because you know, you know, just like this uh, slow-moving uh, reminder of my dad in this in this office, um, you know that the confirmations are there, and you just have to really be intentional yeah. about looking for them. It might not be what you want; it might be something completely different. And I'll share one final thing, because I think the best example of that was um, we're really trying to figure out what our next project should be, and we weren't really thinking about children's at all. Um, but I was saying prayers one morning with Clark and I, I opened my eyes and I said, I'm going to go down to Boston and shoot a little demo with Sonia, our granddaughter. Um, I don't know why, but I feel like I should do that. And Sonia is, uh, is the second daughter of my eldest daughter. She or the, yeah, the second daughter of my eldest daughter. She is, um, really artistic, like her creative process. I think I thought what I wanted to be inspired by was just her creative process. Um, she's a poet. She's a painter. How old is she? She's eleven. Yeah. Now she's eleven. She was nine at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I I went down and I just shot her and interviewed her and asked her about you know where she takes her inspiration from, which is very God centered. Um, but we went to the Museum of Fine Arts and we went and you know she said she found finds uh, in inspiration in books and so I just shot this little demo and came back and showed it to CBC. And they were like, this is incredible. Where did you find out? Yeah. Do you think you could find <laughs> other kids who are yeah. who are like this? And that turned into a 40-episode show for CBC Kids, uh, really exploring the creative and spiritual processes of inspiration, which sounds super boring, but it's not. Um, were they short little mini? Cuts? They're five-minute episodes okay. and each and then hugely diverse. Like of the 40 episodes, we shot 14 with indigenous kids on Six Nations Reserve, which is 20 minutes from my house. Um, and and there you, we're also able to explore the diversity of humans, right? So it's not just like 
these are Mohawk people and this is how they express them. No, every single one of those kids brought a diverse approach uh, through the lens of who they were as Mohawk or Kiuga. It's influenced by so many, so many things. And, so. Uh, you know, we shot with kids from Rwanda and Iran and you name it. It was this beautiful celebration of diversity, but around the creative process. And so I say as a woman to you, when you think, uh, well, that's not what we're doing right now. Yeah. We're not doing children's television. Follow your intuition, you know, um, think deliberately like that really was a moment of inspiration. That was, I really feel like it came from another plane that just said, why don't you go shoot Sonia? Not in a woo woo way, in a very practical way that led to a, a show that really is so in line with reflecting back something more beautiful to the world than they are anticipating. Um, and, and showing how we're better together and that there is unity in our diversity. Mm -hmm. uh, and that by opening up the door through the arts, that it opens up the door into empowerment and joy and inspires all of us that, you know, we're in this together. Um, and media and the arts are like leading the charge. So do it, <laughs> do it and pray for us. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much for offering your wisdom and experience. And thanks for asking all me. your all your years of um, persistence. Not that many years. <laughs> um, and really your optimism. I think that's been the most inspiring thing is we're so bogged down in, in, in what we see on television. But it's also good to know that there are people out there trying to make a difference and mm. trying to bring these values that are already existing in society and these transformations that are taking place and to highlight those, um, I think, I think is really, really valuable. So I want to thank you again for the work that you do. Thanks so much for listening to Cloud9. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Feel free to check out Bahaiteachings.org where you can find more Baha'i-inspired podcasts, videos, and articles.